Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. I'm Roger Remington, and uh, I'm the fortunate person to have uh, the title of the Vignelli Distinguished Professor of Design at RIT, and um, I'm fortunate to have my name and Massimo's name on the same business card. Uh, our purpose tonight is, uh, first of all, to uh, uh, welcome you all here, and then secondly, to acknowledge the uh, um, participants that are here for the week-long uh, Master Designer Workshop, which is what brings George and Massimo with us. And so I'd first like to ask uh, all the participants in the workshop if they'd stand for a, for a hand. Yeah, yeah. Stalin used to do this, remember Stalin? <laughs> <laughs> and and if, if they look a little groggy and glassy-eyed, it's because their project is due Saturday morning at 9.30, and they only have uh, uh, tonight and tomorrow to, uh, to work on it. So uh, we're, uh, uh, we're very happy that, that they're all here. Uh, so the two purposes of the, of, the, uh, of the reception tonight, first to honor our participants, and secondly to honor our master designers. And we thought that since we had our master designers here, it would be a, a fitting and appropriate uh, reason to bring them together to, uh, uh, to interact. And I think that uh, uh, if, if the last few days have been any indication, they'll interact uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, Nothing sexual. <laughs> but we're, but we're, uh, we're sitting here in the university gallery, and we're very honored to have an exhibit of uh, of the uh, work of George Lois. Uh, and over here, in, past the red sign, we have the work of Massimo Vignelli. So in very close proximity here, we have uh, representation of, uh, of our master designers. Um, I have some questions. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, uh, get these two uh, gentlemen to, uh, to react. And I think once I'll ask one question, the rest of the next hour will be, will be uh, taken <laughs> care of. Um, I guess I guess the first question I'll ask is how did you two get to know each other and when was that? In the sixties, late sixties. Yeah, somehow. Uh, Olivetti. Yeah, I guess so. I, I mean, uh, I, we met when we were in our thirties, in the sixties, and I knew his work well, and I think he knew my work person. well, yeah. and I think maybe uh, when I, I was working for Olivetti. Yeah, and also the art directors club, kind and of, and the art directors club, etc. Yeah, yeah. But you know, you he was the, the best advertising guy at the time, and I never liked advertising, so I was so surprised. <laughs> 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 the first advertising guy you ever met that you liked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. you're right. You're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> and the no, rest so is history. So we, uh, yeah. you know, uh, we took a liking to each, each other immediately. I mean, uh, I didn't hold uh, anything against the Italians for the uh, uh, invading Greece in 1939. <laughs> uh, I already forgotten that episode. Uh, <laughs> but you know, we we very peaceful, you know. Yep. But anyway, I, 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 from the day I met him, I loved him a lot. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean something about him that was so warm yeah. and yeah. and uh, and huggy. And also, and also, we're both you know, Greek and, and Italian. I mean, we just grab and hug. You know, we we hug. Men hug. Yeah, but, but and, he's and the kiss. best hug, hug in yeah, the world. Yeah, not, you know. yeah. No, well, we used to get it real flat. Yeah, yeah, flat, yeah, you know. After you, he's the best. Guy. Flat. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, well, should we keep it serious or you don't mind? Right? <laughs> no, I, this this is the way we want to do it. Okay, just oh, like this. You got yeah, it. So. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, my questions here in front of me are, are quite serious. But he ran out of questions already. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I answered that question. Anyway. Yeah, that was good. Okay. I think that first so, one was good. <laughs> so, being Italian, of course, uh, we were doing something for Olivetti. Olivetti at the time was really what Apple is today, in a sense, what Macintosh is today, the most advanced company in terms of ideas, design, advertising. Most beautifully the designed beautiful, products. Like the most beautiful oh. design, just like Macintosh today. So, because Olivetti was the Steve Jobs of that time, you know, from all points of view. 
So be, being that kind of a guy, when, he, when they, it came down to advertising, it didn't go to G. Walter Thompson or, or uh, you know, companies of that kind, which we never, uh, okay, for no comment. And, uh, <laughs> and so it went to these young people, you know, uh, it came to us for a certain design side, it went to guys like uh, George Lois, and uh, so we met in the house of the president of American Olivetti. Great man. Great guy, Aladef. You know, Aladef. Terrific, wonderful. yeah. And, uh, and I remember Egyptian, as it would be today, Egyptian. I was there already at the meeting, and all of a sudden, three incredibly beautiful, high, tall, I mean, you know, guys came into the picture. Right. One of the three was him, the other two were his partners, and uh, but he was better looking than the others. <laughs> I mean, today we yeah, are not. The word is wise. I mean, right. no one can believe what we are today, but if they seen no. us no, at we, that time. We, we were studs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of, my, one of my books is called Celebrity, uh, and, uh, and, and there's a picture of me uh, from 1963, and I swear to God, dozens of people have looked at the book, looked at the picture, looked at me, you can't believe looked it. at the picture, looked at me, and said, what happened? <laughs> 50 years after. <laughs> Well, isn't that, isn't that your portrait, the second uh, yeah. cover for us yeah, yeah. down there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was when I, uh, I, I was on R&R &R in Korea, you know, 1951. Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I went to Japan for six days uh, to get out of fighting <laughs> for six days. Uh, but uh, no, I was better looking when I was a couple of years older. When, I, when, when we were your age, when we yeah. were the same age, we, yeah. Uh, we would knock out together. Yeah. But you'll yeah. always be the same age. And we had the, uh, you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's old. He's much older than me. Two, two months. Two months older than me or something. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the office in the Seagram building, both of us, you know. So if there is something really super chic, is that? Yeah. Right? I mean, no. I mean, I mean, that, I mean, no one had, you know. In 1960, in basements. We had the office in the Signal Building. What? I even had a Rolls Royce to get to it. Oh, oh wow. wow. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> what, what car no, you that's had? That's bragging. Okay, what car you had? No, 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 I'm just No, saying. but I was driving it. You got to understand. I wasn't it. sitting on the back. Layla was sitting on the back. <laughs> in I was the driver. The, the I was the driver. <laughs> and, Layla, and people were saying to Layla, what a fabulous driver you had. <laughs> <laughs> He's so, so, what an elegant driver. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. But that's in 1960, uh, the building opened in late 1959. <laughs> And by 1960, the place was most half empty, mostly empty. Mm -hmm. The Seagram building. Twenty-two dollars a square foot. That's it was number. unbelievable. <laughs> the most beautiful building it could be in the world. Yeah. The modern building in the world. Could and it was be. almost empty. Yeah. And when I started my agency, I, I, I would go to Seagram building. It must be full. I'd say we had the. the any floor we wanted. And I was thinking, the client said, let's go down to my cafeteria, which was the Four Seasons. The Four Seasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was a shock. Yeah, I did, I did the, uh, when I started my ad agency in 1960 in, in the Seagram building, yeah. um, I, I uh, the, the people who run uh, restaurant associates who owned that mm -hmm. and uh, other great restaurants there, the man by the name of Joe Baum created all the restaurants, hired me to do advertising and then I, uh, he, he liked what I did, and I started to do the restaurants with him, you know. So I, I ate lunch at the Four Seasons from 1960 to 2000 <laughs> every day when I was in town, and I counted it up a, cu a couple of months ago, I counted it up, and it was something like 8,942 lunches. Huh. Not bad. Yeah. I eat good. Free? <laughs> Free? Of course, free. Ah, yeah, I mean, when we went to, uh, the, you want to pay? We, 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 you got to be a bum to pay well, for we the restaurant. We went to San Domenico. He took me yeah. to San Domenico. It's a great looking restaurant he designed. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific restaurant. Beautiful. Yeah. What? You, you paid for that? You go to rest. You, you, <laughs> you go to restaurant and you see all these paintings. You know, little yeah. trattorias. Yeah, right. you, know, you know, that's okay. Now we don't do little paintings. We do design, right? Right. But the idea is the same. You do the design, and you never pay. You never <laughs> of course. Yeah, no, it's, it's free for it's the rest modern. of your life. That's why I take you all the time to my client. Yeah. <laughs> Studio, Studio 26. Uh, ST 26. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, we can. How are we doing, Roger? Job, you know, for you how, kids. <laughs> how are we doing so far, Roger? You're doing great, George. <laughs> <laughs> now, if if Massimo had his glasses on. Oh yeah. I don't uh, know where they are. Up, They're uh, upstairs. upstairs. You would notice that Massimo and George had the same kind of glasses. Okay. In fact, Luke has them also. Where's Luke? Uh, where you at, Luke? Yeah. yeah. Did you stand up, Luke? And uh, this is uh, George yeah, Lois. That's my son. Son. Luke Lois. Yeah. <laughs> Who, uh, who, among other important things, is an RIT alum from photography. Hey, that's great. <laughs> but, and his, um, and his, and his uh, in-laws live in Rochester. That's right. And, and they work together. That's right. That's, we, that's work, we work together. So anyway, where I'm heading with this is that uh, you notice these glasses. And some of you may have, have seen the commercials for uh, uh, Super Focus. Super Focus. And uh, George, could you tell us a little bit about the Super Focus account? And, um, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I think it was uh, December of last year. When the uh, I got a call from somebody, uh, a guy by the name of Stephen Curtin. Uh, he had he, explaining that he invented glasses where, where you take where you, uh, to, you to to people's prescription. You know, he did a prescription, and he has the, there's a base there, and you put the thing on, you put your base on, and what happens is um, it, 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 you can. Uh, move a lever and focus on close up to you over there and to across the street. I mean, it's, uh, and I said, I, I said, what? It's impossible. You know, it's, it, and he said, no, I did it. And uh, it's ready to market. We actually, we've advertised it already. I said, what's the name of it? He said, two focals. I said, oh, what a terrible, <laughs> what a terrible name. It's in California, and he said, "Yeah, but we need, you know, I saw we saw you in a film, and you know, you're the kind of guy we want. And you got to do the advertising." Which I said, "Not, not with the name Two Focals." And he said, "What, what am I going to do?" I said, well, "Come to see me in a couple of days, and I'll show you a new name, and I'll show you an ad campaign." And he said, "Huh?" And I said, "He, he did. He shows up with his uh, marketing, advertising head." And, uh, you know, and I explained, you know, I showed him, talked about the, you know, the commercials you could do with famous people. You know, we try to get people who uh, need the glasses. You have to have, you have to be somebody who, who wears, now wears uh, bifocals or trifocals or progressives so that you need, so that you need uh, glasses to look up to these uh, closely and far away. And, uh, and, uh, and I, you know, and I said, yeah, we get a guy like Penn, uh, Gillette, you know, uh, the, 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 the pen that, uh, the show, that great show, you know, and, um, you know, he'll say, he'll say something like, um, you know, when I first, uh, whenever I hear those iconic words, oh, say, can you see, I always say to myself, not that good. <laughs> you, know, you know, trifocals, bifocals, progressives, but now I see the world in super focus. So, that was, so he said, whoa, super focus, super focus. Are you crazy? Super focus. You can get that name? Got the name, right? So we changed the name to super focus. We do everything. We do all this, all this material. We do you know, all the stuff you, everybody's been designing and, and you did it all, you know, and it's all done. It's all printed, right? It, I said, throw all that away, you know? And we did super focus. We started, uh, shot a campaign with uh, people who needed the kind of glasses, Joel Gray, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a lot of really great people. Richard and, uh, Meyer. Uh, yeah, Richard Meyer, the architect, you know, um, Judith Jameson, uh, Alvin Ailey danced there. You gotta be kind of cultured to understand the, the, the people I've used, okay? Judith Jameson, <laughs> Alvin Ailey. No, you gotta be, you know, you, you know you, the, the ones who know Alvin Ailey, okay. Um, and, uh, and, and we start, and so Luke and I do a campaign, we shoot it and everything. We start running the campaign on TV in January, whatever it was. And a week later they, uh, they called up and they said, oh my, George, I've got to pull the commercials. So what the hell happened? He says, we got enough orders for months, <laughs> you know, like, like in a week, you know. Uh, and that's just a, a um, an example. That's why I, I was trying to teach the kids too sometimes. Like, they're talking about doing logos, and I said, well, sometimes you know, some people are going to give you, you, you get logo jobs to do, and the first thing you should do is look at the name, and if, if, and if the name sucks, try to change it. You know, I mean, you, you're not just a logo designer, you're a 
big, you're a thinker, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've taken many brands, and I, mean, I changed the name Halloy Xerox to Xerox. You know, I mean, otherwise people would say, make me a Halloy Xerox. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's a very good brand name, you know. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I try to explain to the kids, one of the th joys of talking to kids is to say, to go and think beyond just the thing that you're doing. You know, so if, a, if you get a name to work on, rebrand it, you know. I mean, you, all you got to do is use your common sense and come up with a great, anybody could do a better name than two focals, you know. <laughs> Not everybody can come up with any of Super focused, but that's what I do. <laughs> well, this is again another example. You know, he, he changed the name of, of, from Alloy to Xerox and really the corporate identity for Xerox years after, you know, yeah. one of the many corporate identities yeah. that Xerox has had, you know, some, somehow. But again, other co connection between the two of us. Sure, sure. But oh, the name changing is uh, it's beyond, it's beyond that. I mean, uh, in 78, I got a, I done a million of them, but in 78 uh, or something like that, uh, uh, got the Stouffer's account in, in one of my agencies and, and uh, I had a, they came to New York, it was they, Pittsburgh, I went to lunch with them to meet them, wanted to say something smart, marketing wise, and I said, uh, uh, you know, you guys are gonna come up with a, some kind of a, 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 you know, a, a, a gourmet diet, uh, line of products, and they said no. I said, well, what do you mean no? Uh, they said, well, how can you not do it? I mean, there are more and more women are working, and more and more people are, you know, are, are trying to get in shape, and it's like an obvious. You can't do uh, gourmet, uh, you can't do t great tasting diet, diet food. No, oh, sure, we can do it. So why don't you do it? Well, I, I don't know, you know marketing bull, you know. You know, marketing, uh, marketing, uh, marketing always is followed by the word bull. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Massimo puts it a little differently. I don't, I don't curse. <laughs> <laughs> he says that marketing is the sewer of society. Sure. <laughs> yeah, no, no, especially you know, if a guy says he's a marketing guy, duck. You know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I, I really upset me. I, I said you can't. So I went home that night and I thought about it. And the next morning I went in, I came in, I did a logo, I did a name and a logo, I sent it down to him. The guy opens up the package and it says Lean Cuisine. And he goes, and the guy was smart enough to say, holy, <laughs> you know, called in his calling in everybody and he said, uh, you know the project we're working on, whatever, whatever the code name was. He said, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. He said, well, we're gonna go back into it full force. You know. I said, why? He held Lean Cuisine, you know. Just the name changes everything. I mean, it was not only a name, but it was an ad campaign, Lean Cuisine, Lean Cuisine. So it's that kind of thinking. There's, there's some, what, the, what you try to teach the, everybody is that you just don't, you know, you got a job to do. Uh, your job is to save that person's life, you know. Your job is to make, make them incredibly uh, successful, you know. You know, that's the thrill of what Master and I do. You do stuff and everybody's, and you change people's lives, you know, just change it. Um, if clients come to us, they're the luckiest people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mesimo, uh, 1972, designed the famous New York City subway uh, map. Mm -hmm. I, and I used, I used it many times. No, we call it a map. <laughs> it says map on the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and there's one right over there inside the, uh, the door, but across from it is the is the new one that he's uh, done in the last few years, and uh, and uh, uh, and so right now his uh, uh, firm is very busy with uh, uh, implementing uh, work. Yeah. And maybe you could say a little bit about the. Well, they ask us to design a website for the weekend, so to find out that there are millions and billions of people in the weekend that they get stranded because all the lines are changing, you know, they have changes because they, the maintenance happens mainly in the weekend. And um, so there are stations that are open, others are closed and the client and the riders get mad, you know, and so on and so forth. So we have designed a new website and the website had to have a, a map. And so th that's why they came to us and said, since we have to have a map, and your map is the best looking one, so we want you to 
to do it. Naturally, we had to bring it up to date and up to the, to the task, you know, particular task. And then there are a lot of other things, uh, if, other kind of information. And just this morning, as a matter of fact, it was presented to the chairman of the uh, MTA, Metropolitan Transit Authority, and it was not only approved, but received with great enthusiasm. So <laughs> it is a, <laughs> so it's a great day. Now, uh, the, the, what is really great about that is not only that, <laughs> it's the side effect. Since the, 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 the website has a map that is different from the map that is around in the subway, and is a new map, you know, it, it is logical that the new map will substitute the present map, you know, in a, in a due time. Naturally, since there are, a, it's not a map, it's a diagram, and there are two kinds of people in the world, people that hate diagram and people that love diagram. People that hate diagram are very vocal. People that love diagram, they're just happy. <laughs> <laughs> people that hate diagram, they make a tremendous amount of noise, you know, <clears throat> and so, they might be proud. But this time, we're very well prepared compared to the first time back in 1972 when we did the map without, by hand, in a sense. You know. Now it's been all computerized, the layers, it's very precise, everything is in the proper place, although it is a diagram. Um, and then on top of it, in the website, we also have uh, neighborhood maps, which are proprietary as well. And, um, where it shows the street, so it shows what is above the ground and below the so ground. So those are maps, yeah, not those diagrams. Are, those are maps. So, but now we have the whole thing together, combined. And the, now, the, um, so we are very lucky that the chairman is a terrific guy that really has vision. So much vision, as a matter of fact, that he just resigned the other day from the MTA <laughs> to go to work in Hong Kong, where apparently not only can get a fabulous salary, but <laughs> there is a whole China, you know, to, to implement over there. And uh, with the vision and the quality and the, uh, that that guy has, I think that it would be very successful. Maybe my call has gone no. <laughs> And he loves your map. Uh, yeah, he yeah. loves it. Yeah, he loves right it. The first thing <laughs> he, he, he asked is, uh, is uh, you know, a reproduction of the map to put on his office, you know, and so on and so forth. So, um, and he wants to have maps in every station now. So, um, and also, <laughs> you know, there is always a kitchen site, which is great. Uh, they have a, a line of stores and online That's products, right. and which have a feature of the maps, you know, and we are designing plates and mugs and t-shirts you know, and, and, and underwear and the whole thing with the map. <laughs> Just the when case. you're a graphic designer and you're advertising, with the search is for great clients, you know, yeah. when you get get one, boy. And never work for a bad client. Yeah, yeah. That is the basic thing. Well, no, I, never I, I work have for, a bad for about a week. I, have, a bad I client, work for bad clients get... for about a week and then I got rid of them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. If you work for a bad client, drop it. Because from a bad client, you get a worse like one. Hell. From yeah. a good client, you get a better one. Sure, absolutely. So that's the basic law, you know, and it's called the Vignelli law on clients. <laughs> <laughs> George, George uh, we had a wonderful session yesterday here with the, uh, with the participants in the workshop, and George did a gallery walk of the uh, work here and uh, was uh, offering us wonderful anecdotes that went with uh, many of these kind of classic uh, Esquire covers. But could you uh, maybe revisit the Nixon cover and tell us Nixon, about yeah. uh, uh, um, tell us about that one? Um, the um, Harold Hayes. Uh, what, what year was it? Uh, Harold Hayes called me up. Harold Hayes was uh, the the uh, editor of the magazine. Um, he uh, he uh, he had just gotten. Uh, he was a part of a triumvirate of three editors for about two years that were vying for, to be the head editor of, Esqu of Esquire in 1960 or something like that. And uh, you know, it, I, I didn't know anything about it then except I was reading the magazine. And it was being edited by three people at the same time. It was like a Roman, you know, it was a Roman triumvirate, mm -hmm. right? You remember that, the Re Roman Republic? Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he... Uh, 
He had just gotten the, and yet the publisher had just said, you're my editor, fire the other guys, you know, and the other guy, got bit of the other, anyway. So the first thing he did, basically, for some reason, is he, he knew his covers sucked. You know, he, you know, he knew how to do a magazine, but, and, and uh, he, uh, he had been reading about me because I had started my ad agency in 1960. I left all day and started the seventh creative agency in the world. And he was reading about this art director whose name was in a masthead, which was unheard of then. The, the art directors were totally unimportant in the, in the conception of advertising back then. And anyway, so he was reading about me and something made him say, let me call this guy who's successful in an ad agency and maybe he can help me figure out how to do better covers. You know? So he came, we had lunch at the, at the Four Seasons. Yes. You know? And yes. uh, uh, he thought I was a sport because I paid for everything. <laughs> <laughs> I do the easy same. come, easy go. You know? <laughs> um, and anyway, we were having lunch and he said, uh, you know, a uh, 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 Southern boy. Southern guy, uh, a, 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 southern, a southern liberal, which is an oxymoron back then, but, and uh, he said, uh, I wonder if you could help me, sure, uh, I wonder if you could help me figure out how to do better covers. I, said, I never had done a cover in my life, but I said, well, how do you do them now? And he described this process where uh, uh, four editors, uh, four editors, uh, uh, four, five people in the art department, uh, 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 12 people uh, get together every month and, dis and discuss uh, what, it, they decide what, what story they should do a cover on, and then they all go away, come back with a couple of uh, the idea, and they pick five of them, and he's going through this whole thing, and I said, whoa, group grope, what the hell's that all about? He said, what's that, it's a group grope. Uh, he said, you mean I shouldn't do it by committee? <laughs> no, no, nothing gets done by committee. No, nowhere. Look at this, look at these stiffs in the, in the, in the Congress and the Senate. No, no <laughs> committees can't do it, you know? Uh, yeah. So, uh, he said, uh, he said, so how you do it? How do you do it? I said, you give it to, you give it to a talented guy, an outside guy, uh, what, kind of, what kind of talent? Well, a guy should be talented graphically. He should, un he should, he should know how to read. You know, he should be, a, should be literate. He should go to a ballet once in a while. He should understand sports. He should love sports. He should uh, uh, describe it uh, all around guy. He said, uh, he said, yeah, but how can anybody uh, do a cover for some, my magazine when we sp spend all that time on a magazine and, and he's going to do it a, a great cover? I said, yeah. You know what? That can't, not possible. I said, clients come in to me and they don't know what they're doing. You know, guys in big, age, big companies are in trouble and they talk to me for, for an hour sometimes and, be, and when they walk out, I know how to save their. Mm -hmm. I could, well, that's got nothing to do. So he said, well, who could do it? I started writing names down. I wrote down Tony Paladino. He said, well, well, wait. Listen, pal, do me a favor. Do me just one cover. I did one cover, and the one cover just exploded off the news. Uh, you know, it exploded. Everybody in the world went crazy over it, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, at that point, he said, clearly, you got to keep doing my covers. And we went from 400,000 to 2 million, and it became the, uh, the golden age of journalism, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, he, he, let me, he had, the, he had the balls to let me do a cover my way with anything that I saw that was in the magazine. You know, I mean, I, and people say today, why can't you do, people do great covers today? I says, because they're, they're no Harold Hayes's. Because none of these could have happened without Harold Hayes. People say, wow, gee, what, boy, you must have had, you, what you, know, you had to do those covers? You know, I said, I didn't have any, I didn't, they weren't me. I mean, I did the covers, but Harold Hayes put his head on the line each time, you know. Uh, while he was putting that head on the line, he went for 402 million, you know. But anyway, so what happened is at one point, he, he, it, he, usually we'd have lunch at the seasons once a week, and they, uh, once a month, and they'd tell me what, the, what was coming up, and I'd go back and I'd do a cover, you know. And I had an ad agency I was running, you know, so I was, I'd do it, uh, you know, on, on Sundays. He called up and he said, um, you won't believe this, old pal. I said, what? He said, Nixon's going to run for president again. I said, oh, my God, that son of a you know. Uh, and, uh, he, and they're going to do a piece of him. I said, well, I don't know what the piece is going to be, but I'm gonna, I'll nail him. 
you know, you know, I mean, I, you know, I just didn't know what, I didn't follow what the story was, you know. If I did, if I was opposite with the story, it'd say, well, to be fair to, the, to somebody, see page 28 or whatever. So, um, so uh, you know, uh, maybe a lot of you may not uh, know the Nixon thing. Nixon basically lost, supposedly lost to Jack Kennedy uh, in, um, in 60, 60? 60. 60. In '60, because he uh, sweated and he looked evil at, at, during the debates, but you know, an evil man, but the evil usually shows, you know. <laughs> and so I, so I, I did a, you know, I'm being made up and said, uh, you know, Nixon's last chance this ter time would be, he'd better be right. Of course, the problem I explained to the kids yesterday, the problem was how do you get a picture of Nixon cr sleeping? It's very hard to fake a sleep right so uh, so that's another thing I tell everybody I said everybody you can't do something well, yes yeah you can figure it out get you know you, 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 uh, uh, let's let's uh, let's find uh, the photographers who, who fly on Air Force One you know who must have flown him when he was a you know when he was VP you know for the other for that other stiff that other, the other Bush anyway <laughs> Um, so, uh, and, and we got to the photographers, and said, did you ever shoot a, 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 any pictures of Nixon uh, sleeping? He said, oh, I got dozens of them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> boom, boom, bada, boom, bada. Anyway, it, it ran, and uh, God, who, what was his press secretary? Ziegler, 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 Ron Ziegler, right? Ron Ziegler. Ron Ziegler calls up Harold Hayes and says, he said, uh, he said, you, you, you left-wing commie sons of is and then Howell said, whoa, 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 what's going on? He said, what's the problem? He said, ah, yeah, buddy, buddy. and Howell, was, uh, every, anybody who complained to Howell, Howell said, listen, I have nothing to do with the covers. He'd give them my phone number. Because <laughs> <laughs> he liked the, he, uh, he wanted me to hear this, right? So Ziegler calls me. He, he's one of the only guys, uh, one of his only assistants uh, uh, to Nixon uh, who didn't go to jail. Ziegler, right? He didn't go to jail. He should have. Anyway. So he calls me up and he says, ah, you son of a, you call me something, blah, 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 blah. And I said, whoa, 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 hey, schmuck, first of all, <laughs> what's your problem with it? I mean, it, you know, it's not really, you know, it just says he better look better, he better look right. Uh, and it's funny, you know, and he shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't be out of joy that much. He said, I know what you're trying to say. I said, what? You're trying to say that he's a, that he's a homosexual. <laughs> I swear to God, you know. I said, I said something like you dumb, you know. You know, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that was that. I got a story for every one of these covers, so we better. Not, you know. <laughs> I really do, by the way. People say, how can you have so many good stories? I said, if you, if you do any job in your life and you don't have a story, you know, you, I don't, you know, I mean, there's fun on everything you do, you know. I mean, literally, there's a story. I can look at every one of my ads. I can tell you a story about the about what what happened, you know. Yeah. And each one is fantastic, George. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Masmo, uh, this, this starts to get a little serious, so excuse me. Uh, but uh, looking back, uh, uh, who've been your heroes in, in, uh, in your, your career? Or heroines, actually. Well, uh, well first, first my heroes were in architecture, you know. So Mies was... Mies? Yeah, Mies. Who, who, who? Yeah, yeah. Miss Van der was my too, biggest by the way. hero. And, uh, and Corbusier, of course. Corbusier. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those were oh, my by the way, by the way, I named uh, the, uh, the glasses. Yeah. Uh, Massimo has uh, these different, slightly different design in gray, and I named them when you go to the web. To, 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 that's Bauhaus, yeah. and this is. Corbu. Yeah, that's you true. <laughs> I need both because, yeah. you know, it and, cover and, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, and a lot of people are buying them and they don't have any idea who Corbu or me or <laughs> both of the house is, you know. So then, uh, then in graphic design, of course, Max Huber was where I uh, first being exposed. Um, but then, really, the, the whole crowd of the late 50s, Swiss, you know, Muller Brockman and, uh, you know, all the that crowd, Hoffman, you know, yeah. Hoffman and uh, Vivarelli, you know, the whole group of the Swiss, Swiss, Swiss design, because it's discipline, 
and he, and he, he was the perfect. The first modernist design. Yeah, yeah. It was the perfect uh, uh, continuity with the Mies, you know, uh, kind of architecture and uh, logics, you know. So I, I'm not an artist, therefore I'm not on the he side. He keeps saying he's not an artist. <laughs> <laughs> he's an artist, you know. I, I'm, I, he keeps saying that. I'm, I'm not an artist. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay, fine. By accident. Right. <laughs> By accident, then. Yeah, you're an artist. With and, a capital A. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course he's um, an artist. So, you know, um, uh, that's what it is. Well, for me, there is a big difference between art and design. You know, um, uh, art is useful but not utilitarian, you know. Design is utilitarian, but not, not always useful, <laughs> you know? and that is... Massimo, when the, MoMA put all the covers in their permanent yeah. collections yeah. in 2008... I was there. And, yeah. they, and, they, and, they, and, and they said, and what was exciting was they said that there had graphic design being done that has mm -hmm. been done that, that is art. Well, you know, the museum will always yeah, like that. I agree that, with so. that. Yeah, museum like that, but that's, that's okay. Um, so that's uh, the heroes, going back to the question, we are really, we are the, the Swiss designers, but the, there, has, there has been many heroes, actually. The Swiss designer in terms of structural design, the English in terms of the wit, you know, boy, that's so witty. Alan Fletcher, I mean, work was so witty all the time. It's terrific. And they have their commercial, their advertising. Yeah. It's witty, you know. It's great, you know, really. Um, and, and well done, too. Then, of course, German design, you know, like Dieter Rams, the best designer of the century, from my, from my point of view, in terms of a product design. Then uh, the Americans, in terms of the discovery of the white space. You know, God, they, no one had ever been used white sure. space better than the Americans. You know. It's because the prairies, because yeah. of the great skies, is because they have it. We in Italy have mountains right there where <laughs> that building is. You know, we're always sunk, we're always, you know, we're sunk. If you look at magazines the, today, uh, if you find me a, a two inch white space, I'll kiss you. <laughs> and every, 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 every page is like a, a, a computer page, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, it's unbelievable yeah. how bad but how you bad look at all design is. You know, look at some of the weird things, you know, the Olivetti or the L magazine yeah, sure. or so on. So forth. I mean, throughout, you know, it's the notion of white space. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the great art directors, you know, from Broadway to Henry Wolf in particular, you know. Sure. And, uh, and soul bass in terms of corporate identities back in the early 50s, you know. Um, those were a great influence, Lou Danziger. So there has been a certain amount of uh, American yeah. influence because what really fascinated me at the time was the ability of bringing design to a larger scale, you know. Uh, in Europe, we were puny, beautiful design, but the clients had this kind of distribution, you know, four guys, four cats, in a sense, you know. And to me, design has to affect the masses, otherwise it doesn't mean anything, you know. Otherwise you do art, you know. But design, the purpose of design is linked to industry and is linked to distribution and is linked to masses, you know. Because we are surrounded by design, you know. Why we should have this instead of a beautiful glass, you know. And, uh, and that is our job, to bring these things, to design these things, and convince people to make them and distribute them. The distribution is still the, ma the, the major roadblock to good design. So, and this is why I like online. Online is breaking now that pattern. You know, online makes people, uh, gives to people the possibility of buying the best looking things if they find true connection and people that want good things, they can find them and order it in line, online, you see. So the stupid distributors, including bookstores, you know, that uh, for their misery and maybe because of they can't spend the money, but there's no point of having a book uh, anymore printed on 5,000 copies, 10,000 copies when 
on a, online, you can have a million copies, you know. The Canon, three, one month, 300,000 clicks, you know, ta, 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 because it was published only on, in a year, a million copies. He's know. referring to the book called The Vignelli Canon, mm -hmm. in which within the last uh, uh, few years, uh, it uh, really details the Vignelli aesthetic. Sure. And, uh, and I, we're very proud that the first uh, time that the Vignelli Cannon book was sold was right here as part of the dedication right. of the Vignelli Center a year ago. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so the, the, this is, the, the, the computer is changing completely, you know, everything, you know, it's jobs of one kind that disappears, other are coming up, you know, yeah. the transformation in the process of doing the work, it's yeah. the whole thing has changed. Books are going to disappear, which is a great thing because they take a lot of real estate space. Uh, they, 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 you need a lot of trees. They're going to disappear, but we're going to keep it. designing them. Well, there be some, well, you're designing, you design for the, sure, on the course, internet. Yeah. The design it doesn't change. No as a matter of fact, the, the design is done on the computer. You know, and then from the computer it gets down to the sure, printer. Sure. That's, that's what the stupid thing is, to send it to the printer. Well, there might be one good thing, is digital printing that you print on demand. That makes sense, you know. But printing for most of the, do you know that most of the books get burned? Not like Hitler, but by the, by the, by the warehouses, you know, by distributors, basically, because the remnants are there and they occupy the uh, storage space, they cost too much, and at one point they just dispose them, you know. So it's a big waste. The, you know, the, the, the internet, I mean, the book online is eliminating that. Yeah. Besides the fact that you can take an entire library on your iPad, wow. History. That's what I do. <laughs> you, know, you take yeah. your library, you, dun, 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 you go you go through your book you want to read, and, and eventually it would be even better. There would be book, mixed media, movies, and, and still, and words, and images. Oh, it's, we're just at the very beginning. We are, you know, uh, about 1497 in terms of uh, books. In this lecture will be in the New York Times Gutenberg next week. did the book, and we are just about one year after the invention of the movable type and the printing, right. you know, in the new revolution. But you know, this revolution don't happen every day. Every 500 years, that's okay. Every 500 <laughs> years, and here we yeah. are. Yeah, exactly, we are right here, right? It's exciting, it's the most exciting moment. It, the only thing that makes me mad, it happened when I'm about to go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it should have happened when I was really in my prime, you know. Well, that's okay, but I'm glad to see it anyhow. Because at least, you know, we can, you know, uh, well, the, uh, uh, As far as here is concerned, I mean, uh, as Massimo mentioned, I mean, we have, there are dozens of heroes uh, whose shoulders we stand upon, you know, uh, dozens, you know. Uh, but the, the one that, really made the most important thing in my life. Uh, uh, the, the graphic designer was Paul Rand, mm -hmm. because when I was 14, I was in high school in music and art, the greatest school of learning since Alexander sat at the feet of Aristotle. And, um, and uh, he was like 27, and I, and everybody knew about what he was doing in his career. He was doing all back ads, and he was doing logos, et cetera. And everybody knew he was a cantankerous art mm -hmm. director. They didn't take any from anybody, and he didn't need a writer. And I mean, he really was, uh, you know, iconic when he was a young man. And I was 14, and I was looking at him, and I'm, and I loved his work. Yeah, but you know, and you did too. But we don't work anything like him. But I, I worked. But what I, what struck me about him uh, was uh, uh, how he, uh, how he ran his life, and how he did. Got away, got away with doing great work, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and he fought for his work, and obviously, and he and he and he had most of it done, most of it printed. I and I realized when I was 14, because I was, my father was a florist, and he ex expected me when I was, when I graduated high school, to, to be, to take over his store, you know, and I never told him I wasn't going to do it because I loved him much to tell him, but, uh, but uh, I realized when looking at Paul Rand that. That I could make a living, mm -hmm. and 
and do and 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 be aggressive and do the kind of work I wanted to do. I could and I could do great work, and so that, he thrilled me, you know. And and he always has, you know. And uh, uh, you know. And uh, uh, but at the same time, you looking at dozens of people's work. Uh, it, it we couldn't have done what we do without that happening first, you know. Well, George, I was interested in picking up the recent uh, Vanity Fair magazine. That on page uh, 113, there's a uh, reprint of the famous uh, Demi Moore photograph. I'm sure you all seen this iconic image. And underneath it is a, um, a, a blurb in, in a typography. And uh, so I read this blurb and. Um, uh, starts out, a, a truly great magazine cover surprises, even shocks, and connects in a nanosecond. A glance at the image by Annie Leibovitz of Demi Moore, the 1991 issue of Vanity Fair. Anyway, I read this blurb, and, down, and it ends up by uh, uh, the writer saying, uh, in the 1960s, whenever I was creating what I knew would be a controversial cover for Esquire magazine, I would, I would warn the editor that the image would inevitably cause trouble. Harold Hayes would always react by saying, yay. Yeah. 20, 20 no, years yeah. ago, when I pulled my copy of Vanity Fair out of my magazine, I heard myself whisper, yay. Signed, George yeah. Lois. <laughs> you want to add anything to that, George? Well, uh, uh, Graydon Carter is a giant fan of the Esquire of the 60s and the, and, the, and, the cover, and the covers and the David Remnicks. A lot of these guys who were in college, college age when I was doing the covers became big fans. You know, Martin Scorsese and a lot of these people have collections of them. Uh, so he, he, they call him, he asked me to do things with their stuff on graphic design. What's interesting about that cover that Andy Leibovitz shot is, she came out with a book. She did a book last year, I think it was, a, kind of a small book. I forgot the name of the book. Annie Lieber to work, some kind of a strange uh, brand, uh, brand to get a book. But one, there was a chapter, uh, uh, like a one-page chapter on idea covers. You know, uh, and basically she said, uh, you know, I, 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 let me talk about idea covers. George Lois is a, he's a master of idea covers, and she named about eight of them, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I, uh, and, I, and I did a couple, and she mentions that. Uh, but the editors really don't like idea covers. You know, they think idea covers don't really sell. <laughs> uh, and she went on and on and on, and I said, it was hard unbelievable, you know, talking about how ideas don't sell and, 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 and covers her. Uh, it's because she's working for editors who let her do ideas, you know. I mean, uh, there's Graydon Carter. It's a, it's a great magazine, Vanity Fair. I mean, if you don't read Vanity Fair every month, you're crazy. But it's hard to look at, you know, because the covers are ugly. The mm -hmm. covers are, are as ugly as everybody else's. It's the flavor of the month, some schmuck. It's supposed to be some star that you're supposed to know about. 14 blurbs all over the cover. Uh, it looks like any other magazine. You know, I mean, when you look at 100 magazine covers at, in, on a newsstand, it's like a, it's a cacophony of cockroaches and you know, everything. It, it really terrible. Uh, but here's uh, Annie Leibovitz, who's a great photographer, who says, who's, who gave in to these sons of bitches and gave in in a book by saying, you know, idea covers don't really Sell uh, because they are, because they they try to they they uh, you know tie themselves into knots they they they, they put handcuffs on by by always going after the, the the celebrity of the month and then great blurbs there isn't a magazine out there <laughs> that doesn't do that you know it's revolting that's why the if magazines are going to die for that reason they should die you know. And then, the, and then the, the editorial design of all these magazines are terrible, you know. And, and, and you know, and I told him, I said, well, I'm talking about Graydon Carter, who was a great, great editor. 
I was in his office once, and he was doing his thing, looking at <clears> his, 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 his paste up with the whole magazine. You know, you could walk around the room and you see it all. And there all his people were there. And I, you know, he said, hey, George, let me look at it. I'm looking at it, you know. You know I'm, I'm trying to, I'm wondering who art directed, nobody art directed this thing. And, um, and it gets to one point, and I said, uh, I couldn't stand anymore. I said, gee, uh, you know, great, and if you t t took this visual and you did this and you, and he said, uh, yeah, and the artist said, oh, wow, and the art director runs away, and he comes back with the thing, you know, and he, he put it up, and he said, uh, and everybody in the room said, wow, that looks terrific. And Graydon said, yeah, but, but look at that white space, he says. <laughs> Pe people who buy magazines don't want to look at white space. And that's what's going on, you know. That's when a great editor can say that. You know, can imagine the, you know, uh, yeah. Tina Brown thinks the same thing. They all think <clears> the same <throat> thing. Jam it with stuff. Do stuff everywhere, you know. Uh, put blurbs on the cover. Uh, get some, uh, who's that Tootsie? There's, uh, Tootsie's all over the place on the front. Um, you know, it's, it's disgusting. People are like, why can't you do great magazine covers today? And, and, and the, the people say that all the time. There's articles written in, in Vanity Fair. So like, why can't they be great? Uh, why can't they be George Lois covers anymore? So, because there's no Howell Hayes's. Yeah. You know, this, Howell Hayes, <laughs> you know. So it's not just the designer, mm -hmm. it's also the yeah, editor. You need, yeah, you need the client. <laughs> the client was Howell Hayes. And right. he had the balls to tell everybody to go off, you yeah. know. Well, the, the, well, it, however, it's a fact that uh, every well-designed magazine has a short life, you know. Sure. And a badly designed magazine, they live forever. So um, uh, this is, this is uh, I mean, th this is a byproduct of the culture in which we live, you know. That's a fact, as sad as it is. And uh, it takes a long time to, it will take a long time to change, if ever. You know, until you know, companies believe in focus group, they believe in well, marketing, they believe design, in all that kind of If you do a magazine that's, that's, that's well designed, mm -hmm. in other words, people look at it and say, oh, it's well designed. Mm -hmm. People don't say well designed, they don't know what, you know. Well, they feel when, when the design community says, oh, that's well designed, that doesn't mean it's going to sell, and why should it sell? Because the content is what sells, yeah. you know, uh, you know where ideas sell. Yeah. So, so um, my, my covers aren't. My covers are, are not designed. No, they're it's ideas. The, it's an idea, yeah. and you communicate the idea, and it's perfect design. Yeah. I, don't, I don't design. I just get a big idea, and I, but Maham, I want to say Muhammad Ali is a, a martyr. I want to say America may hate him, but he's a great, great man, and I, and, and I, and I, and I make him St. Sebastian, and you, and you and you do it, you take the picture, you put it down, and that's design. You can't beat that design, because you look at it and, and it says crisply what the thing is all about. It's so idea, so yeah. d doing things tastefully and beautifully doesn't get you anywhere yeah. in our culture, because yeah. nobody knows anything, you know. But, and I, but ideas cut through, you know, and that's why I was saying that they all reject ideas, you know. Tina Brown rejects an idea. You know, and, and, and Tina Brown said, George, oh my God, your covers are genius, fantastic. But today, um, they, they wouldn't work. I said, why not? She said, well, first of all, there were so many more, so many more, there are so many more magazines today that you have to compete with. I said, Tina, you take any one of my covers and you put it on a, on a, in a, in a bookshelf, to, on a magazine shelf today, it'll leap out and punch you in the face. It'll stick out even more, you know. So they're all full of crap, you know. They, they really, they, you know, it, 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 editors. There are no editors today who got who got who got a, a pair of eyeballs or who got a, who, a heart or understand anything. Zero. Remnick well, Remnick gets away I, I with think, it because he has beautiful yeah, well, has I, beautiful I think drawings. It's a, it's a matter of involvement in a sense because. It was the same with newspapers, and newspapers were horrible. I mean, the New York Times 30 years ago, 20, even yeah, 20 sure, years ago sure, was sure. bad. Today, it's, it's not bad. You it, know, it not, not only that, the New York Times, you take The Guardian in London, yeah. you know, in England, it's a beautifully designed yeah, sure, magazine yeah. designed by designers, sure, sure. you know. And uh, so uh, 
gradually things can happen if you have the right people. Oh, at, sure. At, yeah, at but you, it's a combination. You cannot design a magazine for a lousy editor. You cannot design well for a terrible publisher. You can only design yeah, of course. well for a good publisher. Yeah, course, it has yeah. to be a team yeah. where the guy yeah. you know, yeah. puts his money where, where he's worth yeah. it. Sure. And, uh, so since this doesn't happen all the time because greed is still, you know, the prime motivation for <laughs> for the for society. So um, one has to hope um, that new editor, new clients, new people will emerge and, and get ready for that moment. That's sure. about sure. Uh, as good and as bad as it might be. George, you mentioned Paul Rand. Um, I think it was 1992, Paul Rand was uh, visiting, uh, lecturing at Alfred University yeah. south of here. And so I went down to uh, hear him talk. And uh, he was uh, very brusque and immediately uh, intimidated all the students there in terms of asking questions. So I kind of uh, f felt like I could jump in. And, I, yeah. and it was at the end of his talk. And so I asked him, I said, uh, uh, Mr. Rand, uh, how would you like to be remembered? And he, uh, he kind of uh, stiffened up and was kind of got angry and, and, and said, well, he said, I'm not dead yet. He said, I just had a physical last week and it was okay. And, and then, he, then he was quiet for a moment and he said, um, he thought and he said, uh, I'd like to be remembered as someone who did good work. And I thought that was the most uh, interesting uh, response from such a giant in our field. Oh, he was just trying to be humble. Yeah. No, I mean, Paul Vance, uh, he was a uh, uh, <laughs> incredibly cantankerous. I mean, uh, um, I, uh, he would get awards, uh, every award he would get, I mean, he got uh, the awards above and beyond the ones we got, you know, mm -hmm. the, the Art Directors Hall of Fame, the AIGA, the you know, SVA, whatever it is, we got them all. Somehow he got awards from Belgium, uh, you know, from Bel uh, you know, I, I don't know what the, he came up with. Them. And uh, he, uh, whenever he got an award, he, he said, they said, who, who do you want to talk about, introduce you? And he said, get Lois, you know, get Lois. You know. <laughs> so he called me up and said, right, oh my God, I got to do another one. Okay, yeah, yeah, I loved her, he loved the man. So he gets an award for the Type Directors Club of New York, or whatever the kind of. Type directors all sucked back then, you know. I mean, they were type directors of ad agencies, worked in ad agencies mostly, you know, the art directors didn't do design. What are they yeah, right. They didn't design. The art directors didn't set the type and do it. They had type directors who did it. Oh my God! When I went to Doyle Lane, I had a type director. I said to Bob, "What a type director? I don't want any. I don't need a type director." He said, "Well, I have guys need it. anyway." So anyway, type director. So he's sitting there and they look at six hundred guys, all men, no no women. You've got to be in a union anyway. And um, and I get up and I give a talk, and I give a talk from the high. I love the man. I think the guy, you know, I think he, he made my, he changed my life, you know. And I go on and on and on. And I give a talk, a twenty-minute talk, and then, and I everybody, five, six hundred guys get up and they're applauding, applauding. And Paul stands up and he's standing next to me, and I look down. I figure, you know, what are we? You know, I maybe there's a tear coming out of his eye, you know. And he looks up at me and he says. George, everybody in this room is an except you and me. <laughs> <laughs> that was poor Red, you know. Yeah, well, the, 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 you know, it's time for us to kind of uh, uh, wind down here, but, but I wanted to uh, wind down by asking each of you the same question. How do you want to be remembered? Ah. Well, I think uh, I have this this building upstairs <laughs> that is going to help. Thanks, thank to you. <laughs> and I have my friend in the building. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, I, I, uh, I, uh, I don't know. It's hard. It's such a hard answer. That, that, you know. I mean, that was uh, Paul saying that was uh, you know so full. Of you know, I want to let people think I do good work, you know, I mean, yeah. come on, Paul, cut it out, you know. <laughs> I mean, he, he, should, he, he should have said, and he, and he 
and it would, would have meant something, and it would have been true. I'm one of the, I'm the, the greatest pioneer of graphic art design in the world. You know, that's what he should have said, you know. Well, at least in America. Huh? At least in America. Yeah, yeah. And the, not the world, but at least in America. Yeah, well, right, yeah. He didn't have much of influence in Europe, you know. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, but when, <laughs> but. It's true. Yeah. Well, there wasn't a man, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bill Gold, I don't know if everybody knows his name. Bill Golden, uh, you know, the, the, you know, Lou Dorfman, the Herb Lou Ballin, Gene Federico, the guys that we think were great designers. Yeah. You know, when you said Paul Van, you, know, you genuflected, mm -hmm. you know. Are you going to answer my question? Uh, I'd, I'd like to have people think I'm, um, I'm the best uh, 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 communicative, communicative designer that ever lived. You know. It's good. It's great, too. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Live long. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I'd like to just announce uh, tonight that uh, uh, the, the newest uh, acquisition to the uh, uh, archives of RIT is going to be the collection of George Lois. <laughs> Well, thank you. Let, thank let me you. say something about okay. that, okay? okay. Uh, every uh, every uh, university in America and, uh, and uh, other countries has tried to get my archives. And, uh, and uh, you, know, you talk to them and you know what's in their archives. And sometimes they have uh, somebody good and then uh, you know, s surrounded by somebody good is 40 guys uh, who are hacks, you know? And, uh, and the, the, the woman from Duke University, I keep forgetting, there's a name for the collection. And she called me up uh, six months ago, whatever. She said, I said, she said, George, I have the, a perfect reason why you should now come to give us your archives. This is 10 years going on, it's been going on. And she said, we just got the complete collections of the, of the advertising of J. Walter Thompson. <laughs> and I said, man, you just gave me a reason why I wouldn't come to you a million <laughs> years. <laughs> and the reason, and the reason that I'm, give, uh, I'm donating <coughs> the here is because I belong here. Because this is, this is the only place that's, where, the, where the collections are the modernist uh, you know, if this, for want of a better word, the modernist, uh, you know, uh, graphic designers, you know, and the people that we're talking about, and those are the people that, you know, the, the Lester Beals and the Bradbury Thompsons and the and the, and the Will Burtons and the C.P. Pinellas and the Bill Goldens and the Lou Dorfmans and the Massimo and Vignelli, you know? <laughs> and that, and this is where I belong. I, I mean, I, my, I would be turning over in my grave if my work was at, uh, at Duke or, uh, you know, <laughs> That's good. Okay, folks, thank you very much. Hey.